Can everyone see my slides? Yes. OK, great. Um, well, thanks a lot, JP. Uh, I wanted to start off by thanking the conference organizers. I'm very excited uh, to be presenting here. So this paper on retailing is joint work with Steve Anderson, Leonardo Iacovone, and Sridhar mm -hmm. Narayanan. And even though our context is emerging markets, uh, I think it's particularly fitting during this pandemic where we've come to realize just how much small local businesses matter even here in the US. So in this paper, what we do is we design and implement a randomized field experiment on modernizing retailers in an emerging market. This is an experiment with over a thousand firms. And before getting into it, I want to clarify that key phrase. So by modernizing retail firms, I mean getting them to adopt physical features and tangible business practices that are common in organized retail chains of advanced markets. The main finding in this paper is that modernizing traditional retail firms in Mexico City leads to a 15 to 20 percent growth in their sales revenue over at least a two year period. And for firms that modernize externally, like the one on uh, the left side of this slide, um, this comes through improvements in their branding. For firms that modernize internally, like on the right, this comes through improvements in their product management. So I hope to go through the front matter of this talk fairly quickly, and then um, I'll discuss the details of the experiment in, in, um, in a lot of detail and conclude with some contributions and implications of this work. So diving right into the motivation, this paper focuses on traditional small scale retail. And these businesses matter tremendously to marketers globally because they're the main channel through which around 4 billion lower income consumers um, shop for their absolute essentials. In terms of the firms themselves, they account for around 60% of annual retail sales in emerging markets. And they're really important for livelihoods too. So in my setting of Mexico, about 15% of the labor force would be employed in this type of retail. And that's exactly why policymakers care about improving performance here. And at least in the medium horizon for a variety of macro constraints, these retailers are not likely to be replaced. You see, even in the most rapidly growing economies like China, traditional retail firms have persisted and not been eliminated. However, one stylized fact about these businesses that I've al always noticed, whether I'm shopping in Mexico or India, is that traditional retailers don't have some of the basic physical features and business practices that large modern chains do. And this happens even when they coexist in markets with modern retailers and can visually observe them as in Mexico City, where, my, where, where this study is set. And that's going to be the underlying puzzle I grapple with. What would happen if traditional retailers emulated those features of modern retail? Would there be no strategic benefit, um, perhaps because the customers they serve just simply don't value it? Or conversely, would it help them capture more sales? To elaborate on what some of those modern features and business practices are, some of them are going to be visible to customers. So our modern retailer OXO on the left has a clear large sign, a logo. When you go inside the store, there's thoughtful product display. Um, they might have a loyalty program for consumers. And these uh, features are just typically not present in traditional retail. There are also some features and um, practices that are not visible to customers. So most modern retailers have computers that record product level demand and expenses and keep their stock areas really organized. Meanwhile, the vast majority of traditional retailers don't track any information, let alone product level information. So throughout this paper, I'm going to examine if there's some strategic benefit to remaining traditional or if retailers would actually grow by modernizing. And so I look to what the literature says in marketing on the implications of remaining traditional, and it's, it's actually a really emerging area for research. There's these two marketing papers that um, talk about this kind of related area of the coexistence of traditional and modern retail. So Bronnenberg and Ellickson, they descriptively study economy-wide trends for each of the retail formats. And then Naran et al. have an observational study of how consumers choose between modern and traditional retail in India. But there's no causal work yet on how traditional retailers can compete for, for greater sales um, in these markets, potentially through modernization. So there are two research questions that we have. So first, what is the impact of modernizing traditional small scale retailers on their sales performance? And as I previewed throughout, we're going to separately analyze the impact of modernizing in ways that are visible to customers, 
versus modernizing in ways that are not visible to customers. And this is because we think they could impact firm performance in really different ways, which directly leads to the second research question. What are the mechanisms through which external modernization and internal modernization impact sales? So I'll talk about um, our hypotheses on external modernization first. I think it could positively impact the sales of a retailer by improving their store level branding. And this is somewhat based on the corporate branding literature in marketing, which is either theoretically or through lab based studies linked things like names, displays, appearance um, with improvements in branding. Additionally, some of these studies have associated better branding with firm performance as they look at the stock market performance of large corporate brands. This mechanism could plausibly apply here too, but because we focus on small shops in emerging markets, we have to consider the possibility that external modernization might actually have a negative effect on sales. It could signal higher prices and the less affluent local customers might start to find the business less accessible and not the right fit for them. Next for internal modernization, I hypothesize that it could positively impact the sales of a retailer by improving their product management. So by implementing these systems to collect product data, the firm might improve in terms of choosing a better product assortment, maintaining higher product quality, and procuring the, the right quantities uh, of products aligned to demand. A few case studies in the marketing literature have related um, this collection and analysis of product data to improve uh, product management, but these studies again have exclusively looked at large firms in advanced markets. So we test this hypothesis against the alternative that modern internal systems don't really deliver value um, necessarily to these small scale retailers. So first, without computing technology, it can take a lot of time and effort to keep records of sales and inventory, which may detract from other direct sales activities. Um, after all, these are businesses that have one to two employees on average. Additionally, owners have low levels of formal education and might not be able to use data in their business for better product decisions. Um, and, you know, relatedly, um, interventions in the development literature that have focused on improving financial skills of owners have not necessarily found a po positive impact on sales. So to answer these uh, research questions, we actually face a number of, of empirical challenges. So first of all, there's no pre-existing listing of small retail firms that I can draw a sample from. There's also no secondary data set of firms with uh, data on sales, modernization levels, and so on, so on. And finally, even if the secondary data existed, there would really be no guarantee of finding exogenous variation in modernization levels that we could then use to identify effect on sales. So given all these challenges, we implement a field experiment with 1,148 retailers in Mexico City. We randomized these firms into three experimental groups a control group, an external treatment group that gets an intervention to modernize in ways that are visible to customers, and an internal treatment group that gets an intervention to modernize in ways that are not visible to customers. So um, before I go on to all the experiment details, um, I thought I might pause for any questions that, that are arising. At Otherwise, I can move ahead. Okay. Um, so now in terms of the experiment, so as a starting point in June 2017, when, when I started this work, there was no pre-existing database or sample of retail firms. There was no available data on modernization level in sales. So my team started canvassing the streets, going door to door with a pitch to recruit firms. My field team approached thousands of firms all over Mexico City, and from those screened around 1,600 eligible, to complete a baseline survey. And here I want to mention that I purposefully excluded firms that are very transient businesses without a physical premise, um, thinking that this construct of modernization applies to more established firms who can actually introduce um, modern physical features. Then in the baseline survey, my team audited these businesses for around two hours to verify that the business was eligible and collected data on outcomes like sales before the intervention. And so of the 1,600 firms that were invited to the baseline survey, 1,148 completed it. This is the sample that I randomized and delivered interventions to between March and November 2018. 
Following this, I launched data collection rounds to measure the impact of modernization interventions. So short-term impacts were measured in the midline survey round, which was 12 months um, after the baseline survey, really quite far out. Long-term impacts were measured in the endline survey round, which was 24 months post baseline. And in both of these data collection rounds, we collected photos of the businesses and confidentially surveyed their customers. I'm gonna show you later how I use that data um, to measure branding. And so overall, you see this is the timeline of the experiment. Now to give you a sense of scope for the experiment, this is a map of the firms in our sample. What you see is a 40 mile by 30 mile plot. And so hopefully it's evident that we covered all geographic regions of the city. And this was really intentional to minimize contamination. So I made sure that all the firms weren't clustered together. And on average, the firms were on three miles apart in street distance. OK, so now um, I'll describe the firm, um, describe the sample of firms. So this table shows a sample at baseline prior to intervention, prior to any intervention. Again, I want to reiterate these firms are pretty established. They all have a permanent physical shop, so none of them would be street vendors um, or those sorts of businesses. They also account for a lot of sales. Based on the monthly sales figure here that you see in this table, they turn over around 30,000 US dollars in sales annually. So if I extrapolate that to my sample of roughly 1,200 firms, just the sample in and of itself accounts for 32 million US dollars in annual retail sales. So circling back to the start of this talk, these firms really represent the retail backbone of the city. Additionally, the typical business owner in the sample earned um, $3 an hour from their business at baseline. We can benchmark this against the federal minimum wage to understand that they're not very affluent entrepreneurs. And also intentionally, almost half the business owners here are women. And I wanted to kind of highlight this demographic of low income and female entrepreneurs. It's pretty understudied in, in, in marketing. So after the baseline survey, the next step was to randomize the firms. And here I'm going to show you that the randomization was effective in that we achieved balance across the groups on baseline characteristics. And this is absolutely key to identifying causal effects. It means that uh, the groups are observably the same prior to any intervention across many dimensions, such as employees, age, uh, prior experience, and so on. And given this balance, any differences between groups that we see after the intervention can then be attributed to modernization itself. OK, um, so with that, um, I'll uh, arrive at talking in detail about these modernization interventions. So I collaborated with the five top universities in the city and recruited their business undergraduates into this project as what I call modernization agents. And so every treatment group business was partnered with an agent who physically modernized the business through hands on changes. They didn't spend time on theoretical business education, which is something that makes this intervention really different from those usually done with small businesses. The agent visited the business 12 times over three months for around 30 hours of work, and they made changes from a pre-specified menu that I designed. So what were some of these hands-on changes that they made? Well, in each intervention, I designed a menu of 20 modern features or practices that they could introduce in the businesses. And I created this menu from field work where I observe modern retailers in Mexico City and work closely with NGOs in Mexico. And so in the external intervention, all of these changes would be visible to customers. They're organized into five modules, exterior appearance, interior appearance, sales tactics, price labels and promotions, and customer engagement. And in practice, in the external intervention, these changes were physically made. So some firms um, created exterior and interior signs, they painted their walls, they displayed prices, designed logos, set up promotions, and so on. Now for the internal intervention, the menu of 20 modernization changes were designed so that none of these would be visible to customers. But again, they fall into five modules, demand analysis, earnings analysis, ordering stock, stock quality, and managing cash flow. Again, to show you how this worked um, on the field, I have some uh, more pictures and examples. So as you see, some uh, firms created systems to record demand by product in these ledgers. They created a stock database to track inflows and outflows of, of products um, 
in their inventory, and they, some of them reshelf their stock area to better store products in their business. So hopefully what's um, already come across to you is that these interventions were very hands-on. I really wanted to leverage learning by doing, which has been shown in the literature to be effective um, for entrepreneurial uh, learning uh, to last. And I'll also highlight um, some other features I designed for this intervention. So I worked with a graphic designer to create this do-it-yourself manual that you see an excerpt from on the slide. Um, and the idea was to give the business owners an IKEA style do-it-yourself manual so that they could really implement any of the 20 modern changes themselves. And this was um, the goal was it for it to be mostly pictorial given the low levels um, of formal education in my sample. So overall, we wanted the intervention to be strong and effective in modernizing businesses. And that's important because it ensures that if we find null or negative effects of the intervention on sales, we would know that's because modernization doesn't work and not because the interventions um, were weak or poor. So I'm going to show you a series of validity checks now with some evidence that the intervention worked as planned. So first of all, the adoption and take up rates of the intervention were very high. Around 88% um, of businesses assigned to treatment received at least one session of work with the agent. 80% in total completed all 12 sessions that we had planned for them. So for a benchmark, a usual training or consulting intervention in development econ might hit around 50% um, compliance. So we're shooting quite um, far above that. Next, uh, firms who complied actually made a lot of changes. So the average complier to the external intervention implemented three new changes, essentially doubling the number of modern features that they had in place before the intervention. And in this figure for you, I break down where the biggest changes in modernization happened for compliers to the external treatment, from before the intervention in light red to after in dark red. And it would appear that most firms um, worked on modernizing their exterior and interior, um, as well as uh, we see some work around price labels and promotions. Similarly, the average complier to the internal intervention made five new uh, changes, which essentially quadrupled the number of modern internal features they had in place before. And you can see that uh, from, from the similar figure here, that internal treatment compliers worked a lot on demand analysis and earnings analysis, um, which mostly involved keeping very detailed records of how much each product sold and how each product um, contributed to earnings. So to measure um, the effects of modernization, we then collect rich primary data on the firms, and we do so in the short term, um, 12 months post baseline, and the long term of 24 months post baseline. Of course, when um, collecting this follow-up data, there are some challenges. So some firms are tried it, by which I mean they refuse to share their data. Others didn't survive. And I'm gonna quickly discuss why this doesn't pose a threat to our results. So first of all, attrition was absolutely minimal for the context. 93% of the sample was surveyed even two years later. And additionally, attrition did not systematically relate to treatment. Additionally, the sample of 809 firms that survived were also balanced on treatments. And, and, and this is the final sample um, that I'm going to show you the results for. Okay, so coming on to the main effect, the main results on sales. So I'm going to use a um, typical ANCOVA cross-sectional regression on the, uh, of the outcome Y, uh, such as sales, on the two treatment assignment dummies. And so what I'm going to show you are intent to treat effects, averaging effects across all firms assigned to treatment, um, not just those that complied with it. So these are going to be more conservative estimates of the treatment effect. Key control variable in this regression is the value of the dependent variable at baseline, because this reduces the variance of the error term considerably, allowing for more precise estimates. So now, um, the main effect on sales. We find that whether we look at the short-term or the long-term sales effect, we see positive and statistically significant treatment effects of modernization across the board. To understand the economic meaning or significance of, this, of these effects, I'm going to focus on the coefficients in column two, um, which shows the long-term long effect on sales two years later. So against um, the control group monthly sales of 3,000 US dollars, the external treatment group improved by 18%, 
while the internal group improved by 16%. Now, as an overall amount, this additional $500 US dollars in sales accruing every month is substantial. For this sample, it could cover a month's rent or the monthly salary of one and a half employees. So the next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to rule out that this effect was concentrated among just a few outlier firms. Um, so I plot the empirical CDF for the change in sales from baseline to end line two years later. And this shows you the full distribution of the growth in, in sales in our sample split by treatment group. What we would hope to see is that for both um, the best and worst performing treatment group firms that they're doing better than their control group counterparts. And clearly, the um, entire distribution for the two treatment groups is shifted rightwards. And so you can see, even in the lower tail, um, that the slowest growing treatment firms still grew more than the slowest growing control group firms. And as another note, the median treatment effect in my sample is roughly 150 US dollars, which gives a very um, similar effect size against the median control group firms monthly sales. So another concern with uh, experiments like these is that the treatment group is uh, that the treatment effect is coming from drops in performance from the control group. And I, I, I checked for this using data on the GPS locations of the firms in my sample. And so I have a number of checks that ruled that out this is happening. So first of all, on average, control group firms slightly improved in their sales from baseline to end line. And you see this um, in this kind of navy blue um, bar. Um, their sales grew 100, by 180 US dollars or 9%. Secondly, when I split the control group sample um, into those control group firms who had a treatment competitor nearby, I actually find that their sales grew, sales grew more for these control group firms than those who didn't have a treated comp competitor nearby. This difference isn't significant when we include neighborhood fixed effects into the um, uh, into the regression, but it strongly suggests that treatment effects were not coming at the expense of revenue falling for the um, control group firms in our sample. And when we surveyed um, these firms about uh, who they who they tend to compete with, they largely said other traditional firms. So this is a relevant analysis. So to summarize the sales effect, overall, we find that modernization increases sales persistently by 15 to 20 percent, even two years later. So I do a number of other checks to ensure these effects are robust, such as including non-survivors. I also make conservative assumptions on the um, attrition firms, and I still find positive effects of modernization. The key takeaway is that these results are robust to a number of different considerations described in much more detail in the paper. And I think the main result is important for two reasons. So first of all, um, it wasn't obvious that modernization should help um, firms grow top line for the reasons I had discussed earlier. And second, the magnitude of this effect is notable. This is not a type of intervention that has been tried before, so it offers both policymakers and managers at multinational companies a new lever or type of um, intervention to improve their distribution channel. So now I want to come on to this question of why did these sales gains occur? So what are some of um, the mechanisms that might be at play? And so for the external treatment group, one of the key me mechanisms I proposed is that they enhance their store level branding. In my qualitative field work, the external treatment firms reported that customers were more loyal, had higher satisfaction, and were more likely to recommend the businesses um, to their, um, to their friends and family. And this kind of tracks closely with academic conceptions of, of brand equity. But previously in the literature, brand, branding activities have been tracked and measured really for the largest corporations and the products that they sell. So people have been surveyed online to comment on famous brands like Coca-Cola or Levi's. This really wouldn't be possible here. So we had to find an original way to measure branding for small independent shops. And so we came up with two approaches. The first uses photographs, and the second uses uh, confidential surveys of customers of these businesses. And in terms of um, the branding items or dimensions that we measured, these were based in the marketing literature. So um, we look at Acres brand personality dimensions and customer based brand strength dimensions from Keller. Now I'll talk about the photo based measurement first. 
So the key idea here is that photos of businesses can convey a lot of information on branding. So look at mobile shop pre and post intervention. They upgraded their awning to bright blue, which makes this business seem less shabby. And they introduced this new slogan, hospital for cell phones, which makes the business seem um, more, more fun and exciting. So we took two standardized photos of um, all the businesses in our sample um, after the intervention across all three experimental groups. We then had independent raters who were blind to the study design rate each photo on the, on the branding items. And each photo got five independent ratings to reduce noise. I'll quickly show you some business photos that had really high brand ratings. Um, they're still small local firms, as you see, but you can notice features like brighter colors, signs, posters. And hopefully the ca contrast is clear um, for businesses in our sample that, that got low brand ratings. Now I'll show the uh, formal treatment effect analysis. So in the first two columns of this table, the DVs are different indices of, of brand ratings. And you'll see clearly that the external treatment group performs better on branding as evaluated by these independent raters. In terms of the actual effect size, they improve by 0.13 or 0.14 standard deviations. And critically, you, we don't find any effect here for the internal treatment group which shows that these branding improvements really do seem to be driven by external changes made rather than any common um, part of the treatment intervention like increased attention or, or, or effort. Next in columns three and four, I checked if these brand ratings are um, that were assigned to the firm photos are actually associated with their sales performance. Um, so I regress monthly sales post-intervention on the brand indices and find a positive significant association. So as an aside, I'm also using this data set of photos um, in a separate project to see if we can algorithmically predict brand equi equity of small businesses using just their photos. And the motivation here is that survey data um, collection from firms is really expensive in emerging markets, while photos that you can just take like this on smartphones are a lot cheaper to obtain. Um, so in my future work, hopefully I can uh, measure brand uh, branding more cost effectively. But for now, I'll show you the other intensive way in which we measure customer perceptions of the brands of these businesses. So what we did was we additionally surveyed customers who, of course, directly interacted with the shop and therefore would be relevant and able to give brand assessments. So what we did is we had an auditor wait outside every business for the first three customers that would emerge, and they administered a five minute survey where they asked um, for brand ratings on brand strength items. So questions like um, how willing would you be to recommend this this business to um, uh, people in your social network. We interviewed uh, 2,500 customers of these small businesses in the process in Mexico City in a confidential manner out of earshot of the business owner. There's some caveats here that we had to um, select customers already at the store. Um, so they might have higher brand preferences by uh, brand assessments by revealed preference. So we use this mostly as a robustness measure. Um, but regressing the customer brand ratings on treatment assignment, we find again as expected that the external treatment group does better than the control group. In terms of effect size, we see very similar effect sizes with the photo based measures of around 0 0.14, 0 0.15 standard deviations. And again, you see null effects for the internal treatment group. So the internal treatment group did not improve on branding. These kind of two pieces of evidence taken together support my mechanism hypothesis that external modernization improved the branding of the store. So now let's talk about the internal modernization. Why, why might have um, sales performance improved for the internal treatment group? Well, we proposed that a key mechanism for their sales improvement was better product management. And in a lot of qualitative field work, we learned that the new systems um, introduced by uh, internal treatment retailers help them gain a deeper understanding of their products. Um, so I developed these six product ma management dimensions um, from the strategy literature, and it includes um, items like tailoring your product assortment to co consumer tastes and improving product quality at the point of sale. To measure product management, we um, designed a double audit process with an on-site and off-site examination of the product uh, management efforts by the owner. 
And so let me describe a bit um, to you what, what exactly did we did. So first we sent an on-site auditor to each business who examined the owner on their product management. So for each dimension, they asked the owner to provide concrete examples and evidence of their efforts. For example, for improving product assortment, they asked the owner to physically show them any new products they had introduced in the last six months or tell them about products that they removed from their assortment and then ask them to discuss a bit like why they did so. The first um, auditor would then transcribe these uh, text responses and then we had an expert auditor read all of the text responses for the full sample um, and score each firm for um, the amount of effort they put into product management. And I'll stress that throughout the process, all these auditors were blind to both the experiment design and the treatment status of the firms. So let me now show you the evidence of treatment effects with the scores from this expert auditor. So we find as hypothesized in columns one and two that the external that the expert auditor rated the internal treatment group firms considerably higher on their effort in product management um, relative to the control group. In terms of the effect size, the internal group has a 0.31 standard deviation improvement. And again, as a placebo test, I find that the external treatment group does not improve on product management. And in columns three and four, I showed the association between product management and sales, and we see a positive and significant association as expected. So to summarize all the mechanism evidence that we have so far, we have evidence that external treatment improves brand management and internal treatment improves product management, and that these are positively associated with sales. Then finally, to be comprehensive, we rule out some other commonly suggested um, potential alternative mechanisms. So first, we examined whether customers reported paying higher prices at the more modernized businesses. And we find that there were no uh, treatment effects on, on, on prices. We also measured some other mechanisms that have been suggested in the development literature, such as business owner confidence, seriousness of business purpose, and the time spent on making improvements. And again, we found no treatment effects here, signaling really that um, the key mechanisms were brand management and product management. Okay. Um, so I'll now come to, I think, uh, the, the contributions and the implications of this work, um, both managerial and policy implications. Um, so to the academic contributions first, um, we answer the call here for further research on traditional retailing um, in emerging markets by proposing and evaluating the impact on modernization for these businesses. In the process, we address this puzzle of whether it's really valuable for traditional retailers to resemble modern retailers. And what we suggest is that bottom of the pyramid consumers do value um, the changes made by their local firms. And I think this warrants further research on why retailers might be constrained from modernizing. Finally, we propose and analyze store level branding and product management as some uh, key mechanisms driving retailer performance. And this is a contribution to the um, broader marketing literature on branding and retailing. By experimentally changing the physical appearance and internal systems um, of hundreds of retail firms, we show that theories related to branding and product management can apply more broadly and can help firms grow their sales in a variety of new unexpected contexts, such as um, among uh, potentially low income consumers in emerging markets. So now some of the managerial and policy implications. So there, I'll, I'll start with the retailers themselves. So there are over 2.1 small re, million small retailers in Mexico, many millions more globally. We find that it's beneficial for these firms to emulate modern retailers. The estimated growth in their monthly sales is substantial. If they were remaining traditional strategically to signal fit with customers, we find the strategy has limits. Its benefits aren't supported um, in the data. In terms of which modern structures best help retailers grow sales, we have some exploratory analysis of this, which um, has caveats. There's no causal interpretation here, but I thought I would share anyways. We find that with external modernization, focusing on your exterior appearance and customer engagement has the strongest association with sales growth. And then with internal modernization, demand analysis, cash flow management, and stock ordering seems to matter most. So I'm working with grassroots NGOs to disseminate these insights to retailers. But as you can imagine, many retailers might find it hard to modernize, even if they are um, motivated to due to constraints. 
And to suggest some initial hypotheses on why firms don't modernize, I conducted focus group interviews of 42 small businesses in my sample. And really out of these conversations, the main reasons that emerged were informational in nature. They didn't know which yeah, areas in their business more. to modernize, okay, and Sorry, how to find um, services to modernize. Additionally, they were worried about the costs relative to the benefits. So the natural follow on question is whether policymakers and managers at FMCG companies should then intervene um, to support businesses in modernization. In particular, um, FMCG companies who distribute through this channel have been really interested in this topic. And they might ask, is this a worthwhile uh, in, a return on their investment? Well, we find that the program cost around 675 US dollars to implement, and with a profit gain of $116 a month, the investment could be recuperated in six months, making it relatively cost effective to do at scale. And so I've shared this with um, our collaborators at Mexico's Ministry of Finance, um, who have supported the study and are looking to scale it up. One potential worry is whether this is beneficial to customers more broadly and to other traditional firms. Um, the study wasn't designed to address that question completely, but from the evidence that I showed you previously, customers do seem to value shopping at these modernized businesses, either through their brand assessments or because they get a good assortment of high quality products. They also don't report um, paying a higher relative price for this. Additionally, the control group traditional firms in our sample were, don't seem to be detrimentally uh, impacted by these interventions. And so um, to conclude with the final implication, so our, our mechanism results are also kind of useful to managers and policymakers that are designing initiatives like these to modernize these businesses. For example, suppliers often give uh, retailers materials that showcase famous product brands like Coca-Cola. But our research suggests that helping retailers cultivate their own store level brand can also be beneficial and expand product sales. Also, as um, new record keeping systems are introduced in retailers, um, our research suggests that they should clearly show retailers product level insights to improve their product management. And this can have positive up upstream consequences for suppliers too, as they can more rapidly introduce new products to consumers, maintain their product quality, and have more efficient distribution interactions with retailers. So I'll end there. Thank you all for listening. Um, and thank you to the conference organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, I think we, we still have a bit of time in addition to the discussion. So if there were any questions at this stage, I'm happy to take them as well. It seems like a lot of the questions were, were answered in the chat, so that's great. Um, so I can I can stop sharing now and, and, and we can go to the discussion. You want to start a uh, discussion? Yes, so let me try to share the slides from my end. Um, do you see my slides now? Yes, we do. OK, so um, since I don't see, after I share in my desktop, I don't see anybody from my end. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt me if you have a uh, question on my discussion slides. OK, so thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you for having me as a discussant for this very interesting paper by Shreer and co-authors. The paper looks at the effect of modernization in, in emerging market, uh, and they further investigate two potential mechanisms related to modernization uh, for traditional retailers. Um, as we know uh, from the presentation, it, they start from a very profound question, which is, can these traditional retailers really benefit from modernization? 
Although the question may seem simple, uh, the answer is actually not obvious at all in emerging market. And we do not have any empirical evidence on both the sign and the size of the effect coming from modernization. So it could go either way. Uh, on the one hand, modernization could enhance sales. Uh, and we have a little bit of evidence from the other field experiment done by uh, Anderson and co-authors from previous uh, literature in South Africa where they showed that uh, training these traditional retailers with modern uh, marketing skills can help the entrepreneur to have a growth focus and therefore uh, further improve the prof profitability of traditional retailers. So modernization can indeed enhance sales by improving consumer perceptions and product management. And then the re result of us not seeing that much of modernization would probably due to resource constraint. On the other hand, uh, as suggested by another line of research, these consumers on, from emerging markets may very well prefer the convenience and personalize the service provided by these traditional retailers, and they may perceive the modern retail as less accessible and more expensive. And therefore, there could be a strategic consideration for these local re retailers not to modernize. So for this paper, we really want to collect these empirical evidence to understand which way it goes uh, in reality. And the authors have done a great job uh, telling us why it's quite challenging to causally identify the effect come from modernization. Uh, we know that uh, there aren't any observational data available out there that could be usefully used to understand the causality here. Uh, for those firms who generate higher sales, they may very well reinvest the, the revenue into modernization, and therefore you expect to see some kind of reverse causality here. And we also do not observe everything, such as entrepreneurial ability and the improved access to capital, which appears to improve both the propensity to modernize and the likelihood to generate higher sales. I would also like to note that it's, it's actually not a very easy task for us to measure modernization as the definition degree of modernization varies so much across cases and over time. So I really want to um, highlight that there are so many things that we need to, uh, to uh, achieve uh, in order to understand the effect of modernization and this paper have taken the pilot role to tackle the problem. They causally measures the impact of modernization from a very well-designed random field experiment in Mexico City, where Schreer has shared with us all the causal uh, identifications and considerations in carefully designed uh, verification checks as well as the implementation. Uh, they also measured both the short-term uh, uh, outcome as well as the uh, long-term outcome up to two years after the intervention uh, at Mexico City. I think it's also worth highlighting that they defined a very novel, actionable and quantifiable interventions for modernization. So they have a 20 item menu designed for both external in, uh, focused uh, uh, intervention as well as the internally focused intervention, which allows them to further explore the process that could link modernization with sales. Whether you expect to achieve higher sales from better branding or better product management. So there are a lot for us to like in this paper. Uh, it studies a very, very important and relevant domain of research. Um, and we know from the paper that modernization really works in this case. It successfully improved the monthly sales by between 15 to 20% from both interventions. And such improvement is significant and persistent for at least up to two years. The authors were also very careful in ruling out the possibility that such improvement in sales could come from the sale losses among those control firms, uh, which I will talk about a little more in my comments. And uh, it's important to point out it's really a very challenging job to implement such a field experiment in such a proper setting at large scale. Uh, uh, I believe Shreya has convinced all of you how much effort they've put forward in collecting these data and verifying the data from uh, recruiting a, a highly efficient and large group of auditors and working with them to evaluate the, the level of branding and product management. 
Um, it's also a great example for how uh, economic researchers would successful, successfully collaborate with all parties, going from NGOs to regulators, as well as local retailers. Uh, they're also um, uh, nice to, it's also nice to see a, co a cost benefit analysis that they've done in their appendix to showcase uh, uh, the benefit of uh, modernization intervention, which sets up the guidance for the policymakers to follow up. And it's also a great learning experience for me to, to go through all the, uh, the details in the paper. So my comments uh, next will largely follow uh, on uh, some extensions and the potential policy implications we could think of thanks to uh, opening up the new direction of by this paper. So the very first comment I have uh, is where do we really get all these increased sales? It's quite important for us to understand whether the effect is local or not, uh, because the ultimate goal here is for us to introduce a large scale policy. So would the positive effect coming from modernization go away if it scales up? And what would be possible implications in the competitive landscape in the retail world in emerging market? And what is really happening here? Um, would the modernization expand the market demand for grocery shopping? Probably not so likely. The, the next possibility is uh, from stealing shares. Uh, and the author were careful enough to rule out this possibility where um, the traded firms may steal share from some nearby control firms. However, they also noted in the paper that the remaining control firms saw an average sale decline of a little more than 100 US dollars, although insignificant. So that's uh, one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that uh, although they successfully recruited more than a thousand retailers for their study, we still have more than 10,000 uh, small retailers that they've approached but eventually get excluded from the study. Is it possible that the modernization intervention actually encouraged uh, stealing shares from those unparticipated retailers? And finally, is it possible that the modernization have upgraded all these traditional retailers into new competition with uh, more than chain supermarket and multinationals, which according to the previous literature have accounted for more than 40% of the annual share. So the implication in the competitive landscape will really be something that's interesting to explore as the next step. My second comment has to do with a little more understanding of the micro foundation of the improved sales. This also helps us to connect the modernization intervention back to the marketing strategy, or more specifically, the tension between acquisition and retention. To me, it seems like the external modernization, which is about building a stronger brand, uh, may help uh, acquisition. Whereas the internal modernization, which is about better product management and stock turnover, may help retention. So if it is indeed the case that a stronger brand helps attracting new types of consumers, which has some indication from previous literature, then it would be worthwhile to document. Uh, it would also be interesting to see if uh, such new consumers might be acquired by uh, referrals from the existing consumers. And for managing existing consumers and their purchases, probably with more accurate uh, product management, uh, it's uh, likely that the existing consumers are encouraged to uh, do cross-selling, uh, bulk purchases and bundling. These would be all the possible outcomes coming from better management of existing consumers as a result of the internal modernization. It also indicates that probably the effect of modernization on uh, these retailers across the retailers could be quite different depending on their focus uh, on uh, acquisition relative to retention. Also related to a uh, little more understanding of the micro foundation of improved sales, uh, with that we would probably answer some what if questions such as what is the implication after scaling up? Uh, one might expect that uh, we would have increased store density uh, from having more modern stores um, and um, that means reduced average travel time from their consumers. And pro probably due to the economy of scale, we expect to see reduced prices. 
previous literature predicts that the lower middle class would probably be the major source of increasing revenue as a result of scaling up. And I think with the current design of the experiment, the author may be able to provide some preliminary evidence uh, on the effect of scaling up as they introduced their treatment in four consecutive batches. So there's uh, a degree, some degree of exogenous variation in stall density over time. Admittedly, the authors probably need additional consumer data in order to comment on that. But from what I read in the paper, they already have very rich data on the location of the store, the baseline profit of the store, as well as which subsector they are from. So it would be interesting also to explore uh, the heterogeneity of their uh, effective modernization across these dimensions. The third extension I would be very interested in uh, is uh, how would the modernization works in other categories? For this specific field experiment, 88% of the participating firms sell frequently purchased consumer good. And what about the bigger ticket items like appliances or what about services? Again, previous literature suggests that, that from consumer's perspective um, in a different emerging market, which is India, the modern retail is more preferred for branded and less preferred for perishable categories. However, what's interesting in this paper is that Schrader and uh, uh, co-authors showed uh, the internal modernization, which has nothing to do with branding, has a very positive effect on store sales as well. So it's possible that we, uh, we can find a different effect coming from modernization across different categories, uh, even when a category has nothing to do with uh, branding itself. Uh, personally, I would also be interested in the effect of modernization for general groceries versus the specialized sellers. Um, I don't know much about Mexico, Mexico City, but for me from China, uh, we see so many uh, traditional uh, format news stand around the city uh, that serves a very unique role. And there are often uh, community cafes which are heavily embedded in the local community, which has only the minimal sign for the office hour and the name of the community that heavily relies on the uh, loyalty coming from the community members. So it, it would be interesting to see how modernization really works in these categories. I would also be interested to check what would be the impact coming from modernization on other outcomes than the uh, monthly sales. Um, specifically, what would be the impact on prices? Um, I have to say the authors would be really careful in checking that. They've already reported uh, no higher price impressions relative to competitors based on consumer recall. This is also consistent with uh, the intervention eventually track, attracts uh, more new types of high willingness to pay consumers. On the other hand, uh, I would like to remind you about the way that consumers collect all these recalls on price. Uh, the way they do it is they go to the consumers who have visited the uh, treated firms and ask them what would what would they have to pay at a comparative uh, store if they're going to purchase the same item from a different store. So it sounds like all these recalls may subject to anchory. Um, you've already uh, exposed to the price tag that they've paid here, and now that you try to recall what could the price tag be uh, if you're going to purchase at a different location. So I guess if anchoring plays a role here, then it's um, natural that we're going to see any price differences from recall. Um, so it would be useful if we can collect the real uh, transaction prices or at least the willingness to pay before and after modernization. It's interesting for us to check uh, whether the modernization has uh, uh, helped increase or decrease the price variation. So maybe uh, by standardizing the retail price, uh, it raises the efficiency uh, for these traditional retailers and that helps with revenue. Or probably uh, from better product management, we now have a better knowledge on the demand curve and therefore we can price more accurately and that would predict an increase in price variation. Uh, so that's something uh, in addition to what they've done in the paper uh, that uh, they could check. 
Now, more broadly, if we think about the traditional neighborhood mom and pop stores, uh, they actually offer a very unique value to the local community. Um, for them, managing the consumer relationships with the local community is quite important for success. Um, it either comes from signaling authenticity or uh, from enjoying the social capital they already have with the loyal consumers. Um, uh, a part of it is that they actually provide a lot of intangible service other than the goods they sell. Uh, for example, free delivery, com complimentary rental um, are uh, the examples that I've seen from my uh, experience with these local stores at, in China. Um, so it would be interesting to check if modernization influences uh, these intangible aspects of the service quality provided by traditional retailers. Furthermore, it may influence the way they recruit their employees. So that's an, another possible extension. More broadly, modernization does open up a new battlefield uh, uh, regarding the competitive landscape. So how to balance the cultural relevance versus the commercial competitiveness might be something uh, worth uh, more discussion. And my last comment uh, has to do with uh, why don't these stores modernize? And I'm glad to see that the authors have already uh, set up uh, these focus groups study to get a basic understanding of the motivations behind their modernization decision. Uh, so far, uh, with the current experiment, um, the authors position it as uh, one from either possibilities. Uh, either they do not modernize because of resource constraint or uh, it's out of a strategic decision. And because we find evidence for positive impact on store sales, the authors claim that uh, for now, the resource constraint might be the main uh, uh, reason why they do not modernize. There might be other we possibilities. Um, for we example, three minutes. OK, thank you. Um, so there could be other possibilities for why they do not modernize, and they may have implications on how we can design the policy that best to help these retailers. Uh, it could come from providing informational support to deal with ignorance. It could come from uh, setting up the government funding um, and loans. Uh, it could come from uh, providing uh, financial incentives such as tax deduction or uh, uh, tax credit. It could also come from uh, encouraging community ambassadors who may help with um, the peer pressure that prevents people from deviating the traditional practice. Uh, finally, uh, it's also important to think about the implication coming from competitors and uh, maybe it's worthwhile to have a discussion of whether we need to protect these small retailers from entering the battlefield with bigger competitors. Um, for the developed training program in this study, uh, is modernization agent training program really scalable? Um, that would be very policy relevant uh, now that we're thinking about uh, uh, scaling up the practice uh, from this study. So uh, that's all I have to say with the study. To summarize, uh, they study a very important topic and uh, presents very intriguing results that has great potential to generate impact at a larger scale. Um, I'm very uh, interested in the mechanism exploration they've done. Uh, the exploration here is particularly policy relevant, but uh, that also opens up a lot more questions uh, for future research to deepen understanding on these micro foundation as well as the other consequences of modernization. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for these really excellent comments. Um, yeah, I would. I don't know if we have time to um, respond the, to them right now, but I would love to kind of chat offline about um, the various questions you raised. And I think there were fantastic extensions there, some of which we're um, already working on um, in future work, like really understanding deeply through experimental evidence on barriers to modernization. Um, but yeah, a lot of new directions there. And thanks a lot for the discussion. Thank you. I enjoy reading the paper. Uh, um, I'm not sure I've stopped shared my slides. So. Yeah, you stopped sharing. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the next presenter, please. Can you hear me? 
Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm unable to share my slides, so I'm going to. How about I leave and then join again to see what happens? I'll be back in 10 seconds. Can you see me and can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can hear you. If you have any challenge in uh, uh, sharing, you can uh, send me the slides. I will share and you can um, take control. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I should share it to you, right? Yeah, if you are facing problem, uh, uh, and sharing it, uh, sharing on uh, on screen now. I had sent a mail. I just did it right now. Okay. Are we having a problem? No, I have not received the uh, presentation. I'm just waiting for the presentation. Yeah, one moment. And you can uh, request control on the top. Uh, one moment. Yeah. Am I controlling this? Yes, I think so. OK. Uh, can everyone see? What is this? Yes. Thing? Yes. You may want to click on view uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it's full screen mode. Full screen mode. Yeah. What is this little thing over here? Yeah. Um. Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. My name is Hae Song Yu. I'm a PhD student at WashU, and this is joint work with Mariana Vitorino and Song Ya, who are uh, both my advisors. 
So the question that we want to answer in this paper is to study the how the competition affects the quality of clinical care. And this is a very important question because poor quality of care in hospitals can lead to risk of death for patients. And it is also an important policy question because we want to know whether pro-competitive health related policies are justified. So, and we are going to answer this question using the entry of the high-speed train in South Korea. So, in 2004, high-speed train was introduced in South Korea, and the introduction of the train reduces patients, patients' travel time, so patients can now travel to hospitals that were unreachable previously due to the far distances, and as a result, it increases the substitutability between the hospitals for patients, and which leads to increased competition among the hospitals. So unlike the previous papers that mainly focus on uh, changes in health-related policies or look at cross-sectional variation in competition, we leverage the exogenous shock, which is unrelated to health or the hospital market structure, and our goal is to first assess the impact of competition on the quality of care. And we also want to decompose uh, the changes in patient welfare from this uh, entry of the train, uh, which can be resulting from the reduction in travel costs. And also, so is some, did somebody say something? Probably not. OK, so uh, and we also want to uh, look at the uh, Decompose the welfare from changes in hospital quality and the reduction in the travel costs. So this is a brief uh, roadmap of this presentation. So here is the research question that I just addressed. And after this, I'm going to talk briefly about the related literature and then the health industry in South Korea. And then I'm going to give some uh, evidence, both descriptive and structural to show how the competition affects the quality of clinical care and then do the welfare analysis. So, so uh, previous research, uh, so this is since this is an important question, there has been a significant amount of papers that study the relationship between the hospital competition and the quality of clinical care. And many of these papers use the mortality rates, for instance, 30-day mortality rate after admission or 30-day mortality rate after uh, undergoing some surgery as a measure of the quality of clinical care. And most of these papers rely on cross-sectional and time series variation in the market structure or some health-related policies to answer this question. And as you can see here in this table, there is conflicting evidence regarding the impact of competition on the mortality. And this has to do with the fact that in some countries, the prices are fixed, that meaning that the government uh, sets the regulated price, or in other cases, the prices are variable. And so that could be one reason as to why we are seeing this conflicting evidence. But even within each uh, specific case, whether it's a variable price or whether it's a fixed price, the resulting, uh, the resulting uh, outcomes are ambiguous. So let me briefly talk about the health industry in South Korea. So all residents in South Korea are automatically insured by the national health insurance. And the price is fixed and regulated. So patients only have to pay a fixed proportion of the price and the hospitals are reimbursed the remaining amount. And the most important thing is that patients have the full freedom to choose to go to any hospital that they want to. And so in this paper, we're only going to look at the inpatient care because for outpatient care, there are some uh, complications related to uh, uh, how much coverage they receive. So in this paper, we're only going to look at the inpatient hospital, uh, inpatient care patients, which will result them in, to in facing the same price, whichever hospital that they go to. So there are several benefits of the current setting, and I'll just give you a brief overview here in this slide and then go over the details of each point in the following slides. So all the high-speed train lines were introduced at the same time. 
And although there were some other lines that were introduced later on, it is beyond the scope of the period of study they were looking at. So that's an exogenous shock that happened all at once. And then we have some evidence showing that patients indeed did respond to the introduction of the high speed train, which led to increased competition between the hospitals. And we have uh, detailed data at both patient and hospital level. And as I mentioned earlier, there is variation in treatment, in treatment across regions. So the high speed train did not enter all regions. High speed train did not enter all regions. So there is variation whether on the distance to the nearest train station. So unlike the previous papers, we are able to look at not only before and after, but we're also look at we're also able to look at the cross-sectional variation. So we are able to do both. So uh, the high-speed train called KTX Korea Train Express was introduced in 2007, April 1st. There was a debate on whether it should be KXT or KTX, but uh, the government officials thought that KTX sounded better, so it became KTX. And with the entry of the train, what we have to know here is that uh, the travel time from Busan, which is located over here, to Seoul, which is the capital city, the travel time is approximately five hours, but can also go up to eight hours, depending how heavy the traffic is. But with the high speed train, the travel time has reduced to only two and a half hours. And we also see that patients respond to the introduction of the train. So this is not my data yet, but uh, some researchers did a survey on the high speed train passengers. So they just asked randomly selected 506. 561 high speed train passengers and asked, have you ever used the high speed train to receive medical treatment in hospitals located in Seoul at least once? And out of 561, 36% responded yes. So this kind of provides some evidence that indeed patients did respond to the introduction of the train and use the train for their medical purposes. Now let me introduce our data. So our data is an individual level claims data, which is a representative randomized 2% sample of the total population. And we focus on five quarters before the train and give some adjustment period. And then we look at the five quarters after the train. And because we are interested in looking at the looking at how patients responded to the entry of the train by changing their choices, we drop patients who arrived at the hospitals via transfer or ambulance. So we only focus on non-ambulance and non-transfer patients who underwent some kind of a surgery which has a risk of mortality. And we also have individual uh, level demographic information, including their health status, their gender, age, and whether they died or not. We also have hospital level data, and we only keep uh, hospitals that had greater than six admission, 10 admissions following previous literature. And then we also have some hospital characteristics, such as the number of beds. Now, this is the map of South Korea. There's another one on the north, but this is the south. And this is the train line. So there are two there uh, in 2004, two train lines entered. And we define treatment as being located as uh, certain miles within the train station. So we use various definitions of treatment, such as five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles. The results are all consistent and robust, but in this presentation, I'm only just going to show you results for one or two levels. And interesting thing in this setting is that we have both treated patients and treated hospitals. So treated patients are the patients who live close to the train station. So here the blue regions in this map are the regions that are within the 10 miles from the train station. So patients who live within 10 miles of the train station are treated patients. And then we also have treated hospitals, meaning that 
hospitals are located within either 10 miles or 15 miles of the high speed train station. And moving on to the date, moving on to our data. So this table shows the changes in travel distance before and after the high speed train for patients living in control regions and patients living in treated regions. And the red, whatever is indicating red, uh, means that the differences in means is statistically insignificant. So what we see in this uh, table is that after the entry of the high speed train, treated patients started to travel further distances significantly. And this pattern is more salient if we only focus on patients uh, who live outside of the Seoul capital area. And this is because most of the many of the better hospitals are located in Seoul. So this is consistent. And because uh, we want to see whether this change in travel distance is due to the entry of the train. And if it were due to the entry of the train, then we wouldn't see this pattern for patients who were not able to exercise choice. So for instance, patients who took the ambulance or who were transferred between hospitals, they were not able to decide which hospital to go to, right? So they were just ambulance takes them to whichever is the closest one. So we expect to not see changes in differences for these ambulance and transfer patients. And that is exactly what we see. So we, there are no significant differences in travel distance for ambulance and transfer patients. Uh, now, we also would not expect to see travel changes in travel distance for patients who go to control hospitals because patients are taking the train to go to hospitals that are located in treated regions, right? And, and that's also what we see. So we see that for treated patients who went to control hospitals, there is no significant difference in their uh, travel distances, but for patients who went to treated hospitals, we do see an increase in their travel distances. Now, moving on to the mortality rates, how does competition affect the quality of clinical care or mortality rates? We use the 30 day mortality rate following a surgery and or various kinds of surgery. We also control for the risk of riskiness and the, how severe the sickness is. But anyway, here, these are the raw mortality rates of host, at the hospital level. And these raw mortality rates do not take into account unobserved hospital fixed effects, nor does it take into account patient selection into hospitals. So patients uh, assignment to hospitals is not random because sicker patients may prefer to go to higher quality hospitals, right? So the, this does not take into account for that. And hence, in this table, we do not see any results yet. So our main idea is to compare the mortality rates uh, before and after using difference in, differences and differences approach. And we want to estimate this uh, OLS model where the dependent variable is a binary variable. No, 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 no. This dependent variable is a hospital level mortality rate. And we want to regress this on the post train period and the interaction between the post and whether the hospital is treated or not. And we also control for hospital fixed effects. Now there's an issue here, which is very important. And the issue is that there is a potential selection issue, which is a classical issue that is raised in almost all of these hospital quality literatures. So what, what happens here is that sicker patients tend to go to higher quality hospitals, which makes higher hospital higher quality hospitals to have higher mortality rates. And so we cannot rely on raw mortality rates to infer hospital quality. So previous literature addressed this concerns using the instruments and they use the uh, distance from patient's location to each of the hospitals as a set of instruments. And the identifying assumption is that Patients unobserved severity of illness is 
identically distributed across population. So it is uncorrelated to the distance to each of the hospitals. So this instrument has, has been widely used in the previous literature. Now, in, in this context, in our context, it is slightly different in the sense that the entry of the train makes traveling easier. And because it makes travel easier, it is possible that sicker patients are more likely to respond to these to these changes. So sicker patients may take the train and go to higher hospitals. So, that, so it is possible that the selection issue, which I described above, is aggravated after the entry of the train. So now we need to account for the fact that the pre and post selection is different, meaning that the selection has been aggravated. And to, and to solve this problem, we use different sets of instruments for control patients' health status in the pre and post train periods. And I'm going to describe about these instruments uh, in a bit in, in details in a little bit more in, uh, later on the slides. So uh, we follow the Gorisan Karan and town, and we use and to obtain the adjusted mortality rates, we estimate this linear probability model where the mu here is a binary variable which indicates whether the patient died or not. And then we regress this on the patient's vector of hospital, dummy of hospital choice, whether he chose a certain hospital and his observed severity of illness. So this is like his gender, age, what type of surgery he went, underwent and his diagnosis, his comorbidity and so on. And this estimated hospital fixed effect psi will be used as the measure of the hospital mortality quality. And I'm just going to call this and I'm going to call this psi adjusted mortality rate. Now the problem here is that hospital choice is correlated with the patient's unobserved severity of illness. This is because, as I said earlier again, Sicker patients may prefer to go to higher quality hospitals. So there is this endogeneity problem which we have to correct for. So we use the travel time to, to each of the hospitals as an instrument. And to account for the changes in degree of selection pre and post entry of the train, we say that the, uh, the travel time is the minimum between the driving time to the hospital or the train time to the hospital, so whichever is the shortest, for patients who live in the treated regions, and for all other patients who live further away from the train station, they arrive to the hospital by car. So th this is their travel time. Now, uh, this method here that we used, the Grizzan Karan in town 1999, this uses the linear probability model, but our dependent variable mu is binary. So our next step for this paper is to use the Gerike Gorsan Karan and Tan, which uses a nonlinear model to estimate the uh, just the mortality rates. But for now, we're going to stick with the with this linear probability model, and and this next steps will be done in the next version of this paper. Uh, and these, uh, this table shows the validity of our instruments. The instruments are all valid. And now, before I show the results of the difference and differences, uh, here we show the parallel trend of the hospital level mortality rates. So these are the raw, raw mortality rates at the hospital level, and we can see that treated and controlled hospitals approximately follow a parallel trend. So any un unobserved factor that affects uh, mortality rates affected control and treated hospitals uh, equally. Now, OK, so this is the diff results. Here, I'm going to show you step by step how the results change as I gradually control for selection problems. So first, this column one here shows 
uses the raw mortality rates, which does not control for any patient selection as the dependent variable. And when we don't control for any patient selection, the results are negative, but they're not significant. Now, uh, we control in this column too, we control for patients observed severity of illness, but we do not control for their unobserved severity of illness. So we only use OLS. We don't control for unobserved uh, severity using the instruments. And so when we don't control for their unobserved severity of illness, we find that the definitive coefficient here is negative, only marginally significant, meaning that the mortality rates decreased after the entry of the train for treated hospitals. Now here, finally, we also control for not only the observed health conditions, but also for unobserved health conditions using the distance instruments. And in this case, we find that the definitive coefficient is significant and negative, implying that in, uh, increased competition leads to lower mortality rates. Now, in our, in this, uh, in, uh, now uh, what I want to say is that in our final sample, we excluded emergency uh, ambulance and transfer patients because these patients did not exercise choice. But we expect to see the same results even if we include these patients into our sample because the hospital does not discriminate depending on how the patient arrived at the hospital. And so that's exactly what we see. When we include ambulance and transfer patients into our sample, our results are consistent and again significant, suggesting that increased competition improves the quality of clinical care. This. So now that we've seen that the competition improves the cl clinical quality in hospitals, we're going to move on to the structural model to do some uh, counterfactuals and welfare analysis. So the goal of this model is to evaluate the impact of the entry of the high speed train on patients welfare. And we are going to decompose the changes in welfare for treated and controlled hospitals and also decompose it. Uh, uh, and decompose the changes due to the reduced travel time and the re increased quality of care. So we're going to do a reverse contrafactual exercise so that we estimate the model in the post high speed train period and then we remove the train to see how the results, the, how the patient's choices differ and how the outcomes differ. So in our model, the ut patient's utility from choosing a hospital depends on his characteristics and also a hospital's characteristics such as number of beds, the mortal the adjusted mortality rates of the hospital, and also the travel time from patients home to the hospital. And of course, this travel time accounts for the fact that patients living in treated regions have a shorter travel time than the ones, as opposed to the case where there were no train. And now because uh, entry of the train uh, changes reduces the travel time and changes the and therefore some of the hospitals that were not considered before the train can now be considered so this entry of the train changes the consideration set of patients so we want to impose this time constraint threshold to each of the patients so that their cons their consideration sets flexibly change with uh, the entry of the train. So here in this model, each patient have their travel time threshold and which this threshold depends on his patient's demographics and also his observed health status. And he only chooses hospitals that are located within this threshold. So this is an example. So this is the patient and there are hospitals nearby, and if this patient's travel time cons constraint was one hour, she would only consider this, this, and this hospital. 
So these are the results. So we do find that patients do not like traveling lo uh, longer distances. And we also find that patients do not like hospitals with high mortality rates. So this shows that patients do care about the quality of clinical care. And these are some uh, other hospital characteristics interacted with their demographics and severity of illness. So moving on to counterfactuals. Now we, now we want to remove the train by replacing the travel time with that of the pre-train travel time. So we, what happened? Okay, so somehow this animation doesn't work because uh, for some reason, but what's supposed to happen is that this train over here will be removed and these two hospitals here will move to the direction of this arrow. So these two hospitals will be removed from this patient's consideration set as this train is removed. So there are changes in the patient's consideration set. So our first counterfactual is how does patient's welfare change as a result of the entry of the high-speed train so we calculate the uh, changes and every changes in surplus per patient before and after uh, with the train and without the train. And what we see here is that so there are two cases that we should consider here. So the first case is where the train enters, but the hospitals do not respond to this entry by so the hospitals in case one do not adjust their quality of clinical care. And in case two, uh, hospitals also respond to these changes by adjusting their quality of clinical care. So in case one, what happens is that when hospitals do not respond to the, these changes by adjusting their quality, treated patients experience an improvement in their welfare due to the reduction in travel time. But control patients don't because they do not benefit from the entry of the high speed train. And we can also convert this these changes in utility into dollar value using the back of the envelope calculations by uh, using the one minute reduction in travel time to hospital value which has been previous which has been previously estimated at $167. So if we apply that uh, measure, we can see that treated patients experience approximately a thousand dollar increase in welfare uh, annually. So this is annually. If the hospitals respond to increased competition by also improving their quality of clinical care, what we see here is that not only the patients, treated patients benefit, but also controlled patients also benefit because as we've seen before, controlled patients also travel to treated hospitals. So if the consideration sets changes and if the hospitals respond by changing their quality of clinical care, by improving their quality of clinical care, both treated and controlled patients uh, experience an increase in their welfare and they, they uh, experience, uh, they become happy. <laughs> yeah. And then our second counterfactual is to see how the entry of the high speed train affects the number of patients survival. So we want to calculate the number of lives, number of lives that were saved. So uh, we calculate the expected differences in mortality across all patients if there is train and if there is no train. And this difference will show how much patients are more likely to survive. So what do we find? We find that if the train enters uh, in our data, 12.8 more lives can be saved annually but as I mentioned earlier, our data is a 2% random sample. So if we take into account this 2% random sample, uh, 
on the on the in the entire population, approximately 640 more people can survive after the entry of the high speed train, which is a pretty large number. And this change happens through treated patients sorting to better hospitals and also benefiting from changes in quality of clinical care and also control patients uh, benefiting from the improved quality of care. So uh, to summarize, the entry of the high speed train leads to an increase in the size of the patient's choice sets, which leads to increased substitutability and leads to increased competition for hospitals. And we find that increased competition leads to improvement in adjusted mortality rates. And we also find that patients experience an increase in their welfare due to reduction in travel time and also due to improvements in hospital quality. And as a result, more lives can be saved due to these changes. So thank you very much. I think I'm right on time. And so I will stop sharing the slides, but I don't know how to do that because. Uh, so. OK. Thank you. Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, we have a few more minutes, right? So uh, anyone has a question for Heisan? OK, if not, I'll just start with uh, one second. Okay, can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, thanks to Nanda that uh, I was uh, given this very nice paper to discuss. And I think I, I, I should also say it's not just because it's vertical quality, it's also because the horizontal match is kind of matches my own uh, personal research interest. So Nanda, you did a great job in uh, selecting, you know, matching the presentation to the discussion. Okay, so... Um, this paper talks about the hospital competition and the quality. I think this is a very interesting paper to read. And I'm in Xie, I'm uh, from UT Dallas. So uh, first I will just give a uh, you know, very quick kind of uh, summary of what the uh, key question asking here. So the study examines the effect of competitive com intensity or service quality in the context of healthcare. Okay, so did you see the slide now? The slide disappeared for me. The okay. slide stopped. The slide stopped. OK, let me do it again. Sorry. Now we are able to see. OK, I'm, I'm not able to see in I don't know why. Can you can you stop presenting and start again? Maybe it's loading. Let me see. Uh, uh, I, I can see now. I can see it. Okay, it's good. Thank you. Good. All right. So why is it interesting? Because this is a life and death question, right? That matters to all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about the contribution to the literature, we can see, although this is such an important question, has been well researched before, but there is a, this a controversy in the literature. And there is some theory predictions, but in the, on the empirical side, there are some um, papers find a positive effect, some papers find the opposite. And I think the author did a very good job um, in kind of uh, uh, listing the number of challenges in the empirical study, why sometimes it might be difficult to causally identify the effect. Okay, so what did they do in this paper? They, I think I really like what they have done is they utilize both what I call non-structural, like a quasi-experimental approach and the structural approach to um, solve the problem, to answer the research question. 
So first, what they utilize is this is a very unique and uh, uh, exogenous shock of uh, high-speed train entry in South Korea. They take advantage of that, avoid a bunch of these problems they have identified in the previous empirical literature that to establish causality. How does this high-speed train entry therefore causing um, the change in uh, hospital competition intensity, and would that lead to a change of uh, the mortality rate change in the treated hospital? So, but they didn't stop there. They went ahead and did a structural model considered the effect of travel time, and did this two-stage model consideration set formation that we influenced by the travel time, travel constraints. And then the, the, the conditional choice model that considered the quality, considered the travel time, so all enters this uh, conditional utility. So uh, based on that estimate, they were able to do um, a few very interesting counterfactual exercises. Um, I really like this set of uh, counterfactual exercises a lot. So um, they are able to um, basically partition the wear field gain due to the entry of high-speed train entry to um, whether this is due to the travel time reduction, whether this is due to the quality uh, improvement, and also whether this is only affecting the treated patient who live very close to the high-speed train, or it also spill over to the control patient, the untreated patient. So I think generally this is a very interesting question, and they took you know this uh, both non-structural structural approach to tackle the problem. I think this is a really enjoyment to, for me to read the paper. Okay, the idea analysis. So this uh, map you guys uh, see, um, Hai San just you know showed you guys this. This is the treated. This is the um, high speed train, and the shaded area is the treated area. So in this case, we have both the treated patients whose travel time to the uh, nearby hospitals will be reduced due to the entry of high-speed train. Also, you will have this treated hospital that in the shaded region that you can see that because now with this reduced travel time, probably the patients near, near uh, live near uh, the, the railway station, this uh, high-speed train station, they will consider more um, hospitals. So therefore, they will have a large consideration set. Therefore, that will influence their hospital choice. And due to this intensified competition, so you might see the improved healthcare quality. So this, although they did not quite, I think I made up this uh, a chain of action here, they did not quite have that, but pretty much I think that's the implied mechanism how you are going to observe from high-speed train entry, you infer the intensified competition, and then to the final outcome, which is the improved um, healthcare quality. So this is the main uh, DID equation they estimated in the paper. So one of the questions I have, just like for robust check, because if you observe this uh, um, parallel trend graph here, you do see some seasonality here. So why only just consider pre and post? Can we just do a time fixed effect, see you know, whether the a result is still robust? Another question, I mean, just very quick comment here is what happened during this adjustment period? I understand that you take out the adjustment period about a little bit more than a year, just to make sure you could probably match the seasonality, also give the patients enough time to uh, kind of uh, internalize the change of the environment and uh, the entry of the, uh, uh, the high-speed train and to utilize the train. But I was just wondering, basically, how do they do learn to adjust to the environment, you know, what happened in between. Do we see actually this quality change is happening gradually because quality change is not, uh, you know, overnight change. So I think it could be interesting for you to explore a little bit, like thinking about more granular time, like how these effects are happening over time. Okay. So um, I think this is, uh, and hey Sam actually spent quite a lot of time, I think in the paper, they also did a very good job. Um, tackling this patient selection bias, because we cannot just use a raw mortality rate as the quality uh, measure, because we know that 
if you're really sick, you probably will, you know, be more important for these patients to choose the high quality hospital. So if you only use the rural mortality rate as the quality measure, so that you can see that the high quality hospital might have more severely ill patients, and so therefore that will have their mortality rate, the rural mortality rate adjust kind of upwards. So the way they do that, um, due to the data limitation, they mentioned that they cannot really uh, condition on the surgery type or illness so severity. So because they only have 2% of the whole patient population, doing that basically will leave the sample really small. So what they did is using this uh, IV approach, but they did a clever transformation of that, trans um, transforming from the IV used before is the travel distance to travel time, which is like much more relevant and take advantage of this high speed, way, uh, high speed train entry in this particular case. I think that's very clever. And they used adjusted mortality rate as the quality measure uh, for their DID analysis. But one of the things um, I would like to see, the graph here, uh, what you have is this, uh, um, this uh, parallel trend graph you presented. My understanding is this is the raw mortality rate, right? For the yes. treated versus uh, control. So I want to see how this adjusted mortality rate, because that's the real measure you use. If you use that, how does graph change? Okay. All right, so moving to the model of hospital choice. So what they have basically considering these are two um, stage model, you have a considerably set formation, and then you actually have this conditional choice, um, conditional on the considering consideration set. The consideration set is limited by the travel constraint, whether you have a particular um, time as a limit. So you only choose the hospital and consider the hospital within that particular travel distance. So um, I think due to the time constraint, um, Heisan did not quite mention the methodology they use uh, in uh, modeling this particular uh, stage, uh, consideration set formation, but I think it's really neat. They uh, consulted the transportation literature and the borrow of this particular approach. I think it's, uh, it's, 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 I think for me, it's like kind of learning a new tool is, um, is nice. So, um, okay, that's just a very quick summary of uh, the paper. A few suggestions here. I think the most important thing for me is like want to know a little bit more. So they probably due to the paper, um, you know, space limit, it didn't put so much detail here. But I, as I have uh, some experience doing research using the US, you know, uh, healthcare or pharmaceutical decision making data. So what I really want to know a little bit more is about institutional details on hospital choice in South Korea. So I've given my limit, you know, kind of uh, experience as a patient here and in China. So I just wondering in South Korea, Although the patient has a liberty to choose whichever hospital, but to what extent the patient is the sole decision maker in the hospital choice? Or this is also because if they actually consult a physician, is that the joint decision making? So maybe a little bit discussion, clarification on that will be great. And another thing, I think I understand the reasoning why you focus on inpatient surgery, because you know you want to consider situation when the severity of the disease is really uh, enough that basically, you know, um, they will be more responsive to this travel time change. But however, the problem here is like, as I see, is the inpatient, you know, surgery procedure, especially I think now we are only talking about non-emergency case and non-acute case. I don't know whether they are really admitted on the spot, like say, okay, today I just decide I need to get a surgery. I don't think I can just, you know, get my car and go to the hospital and say, okay, I want the surgery right now. So normally this is probably arranged beforehand. So in this, part, this case, especially if I'm talking about like inpatient procedure that I might need to be staying in the hospital for several days. So how much does this one-time travel cost matter? So the good thing is if you find, even in this case, right? So these uh, travel costs still matter. So that's a very conservative estimate of the impact of high-speed train or the competition on the quality care. So that's great. But I'm still just wondering maybe, you know, 
talking a little bit more about you know this uh, um, hospital choice, how this process decision making is done um, in South Korea, like a typical case. Take for particular example, one, you know, I don't know, like a surgery procedure. This is how it happens. A little bit of clarification of that will be great. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what uh, I mentioned earlier. So the travel costs might matter more for the outpatient service because I need to go to the hospital and return home the same day, right? So that tra travel cost may be much more salient in that case. Understand because of these different tier payments, you exclude some of the cases, like you are not considering those cases in your paper. But I, I think you probably can just condition the, you know, which tier of the hospital you go for this outpatient service. And I think you can totally use that for the similar type of analysis. And maybe the travel cost actually matters more for those, uh, for those uh, cases. Okay, this is uh, related um, basically uh, for us, uh, to the previous comment, which is about the availability of beds and the waiting time. I think normally these are the very constraining factors for the hospital choice for surgery. So if I want to go to a very good hospital for this particular type of surgery, I mean, can I get in, right? So uh, they might have a long waiting list. So can I really schedule the surgery at the time that I feel like they are not really delaying my case? Um, the hospital quality, uh, I guess here we are just using this uh, hospital specific quality measure before and post. But do patients observe this adjusted quality of healthcare? If not, what do they use as a proxy for this uh, hospital quality measure? So I think this matters more probably for the second part of the analysis, which is the considering set formation. So you do have this adjusted mortality rate entering the utility function, right? So I was just wondering to what extent you probably can justify. So this is, should be a rather common knowledge to um, the patient. Um, this is just like my out of curiosity, you know, I, I don't know whether that's the case for South Korea. Some hospital is really known for certain specialty. In Texas, we all know, and probably in the whole world, we know that we have this uh, MD Addison, that's the cancer um, hospital specialized in cancer in Houston. That's really the probably the world renowned institution for that type of disease. So I just wonder if that's the case, could that be my consideration set is much smaller if I'm really, I mean, particular type of surgery, I'm thinking about the more like a specialty rank for the hospital rather than the general kind of hospital quality rank. Um, okay, awareness hospital. So I don't know whether this is allowed in uh, South Korea. I'm simply asking this because my colleague uh, TI has some paper, wonderful paper on hospital advertising. So especially you know, you're talking before and after the high speed train entry. So I just wonder whether some hospitals, they think they might benefit from this uh, high speed train entry. They are going to utilize that and kind of increase their awareness campaign and doing more advertising. Okay, so I think this is basically um, the, the kind of uh, suggestions or some of the details are not very clear. I hope you can probably spend some, you know, kind of uh, have a couple of paragraph in the paper to clarify. And this actually will answer a lot of some of these suggestions that I will say now here. So alternative explanations, I don't know whether you have considered some of this. For example, you mentioned market structure, right? So that's one of the things the previous paper studied a lot on this topic. So I just wonder, because you only consider the hospital that they are actually were there both before and after the entry. So you are conditional on this hospital were there before the entry of the high-speed train, but what about the exit of some of the hospitals and entry of some of the new hospitals after the introduction? So basically, although you're only considering the same set of hospital, but the outside environment might change and this change might be different for the control and the treated hospitals. So do we control for that? And do we at least check they are rather stable? Okay, and the other thing is, I don't know whether this is something you observe. So maybe some anecdotal evidence or some other publications you can cite. Do we observe high quality physician? I think you have this like wave of relocation to um, the areas close to high speed train. 
So this, I'm asking this question because we do observe that a large influx of um, you know, people from other states to Texas in the recent years. So I'm just asking whether these could explain some of the you know, changes you see in the quality um, of the hospital. I think more broadly, these questions are related to what I want to say, what's the mechanism? So you should, I think this is basically the kind of um, the, the chain of the effects I trying to uh, picture in the previous slides. But what we really see in the DID is basically the, the entry high-speed train on the final outcome is called the change. But I wonder whether you can provide more evidence analysis on the middle steps. So I think if that's not possible, can we actually think about to make the mechanism work, what are some of the moderators to enhance or weaken the effect we observe here? Different type of surgery, a different type of patients, or different type of hospitals, they might be subject more or less to this competition effect brought about by the high-speed train entry. Okay. Okay, um, this is about the consideration set, I think, we do not observe the consideration set. This is not like, you know, some of the paper, they use the survey data and they ask consumer, what have the hospitals come to your mind when you actually, if you imagine yourself, uh, a need to um, get a certain type of surgery. So if that's the case, I mean, maybe some discussion and identification will be needed here. So because I think one can imagine many of the variables that probably influence the consideration set formation will also influence the conditional choice probability. How do we actually identify the impact on impact, whether they are really in, on the consideration set or is on the conditional choice probability? So maybe you can use some industrial uh, institutional background or even model free evidence to help justify for this identification. So um, last suggestion, I think this is related to what I mentioned before about you know, this uh, kind of in each of the period, how does the quality change if it doesn't happen uh, overnight? I think you do have rich enough data. You might be able to see just like for each quarter. So how does the quality actually gradually change? Do they actually adjust? You know, kind of um, when did this uh, quality adjustment, you start to see the improve? And will this effect dissipate over time? I think, again, it's interesting to see that. And also, you probably can help us to understand the mechanism a little bit better. All right. So that's all I want to say. In summary, this is a very interesting and thought-provoking paper. I really enjoy reading the paper. I think this is, goes beyond just the usual marketing mix variable, make us to think about very fundamental uh, infrastructure change, how that would influence consumers' decision-making. In this case, it's like a life and death kind of decision, right? Hospital care. And um, I, I also like the fact they actually, um, because this is, they're dealing with high-speed train entry and how that will influence consideration set formation. So a lot of this are not the usual kind of problem we study in marketing. So they, um, they, uh, they, they, they basically, um, you know, tackle the challenge by using the nice tools borrowed from transportation, from, um, I think, healthcare economics. I think I really like the facts. I learned quite a bit from this paper. And they have very important, interesting welfare and policy implications from this study. So, you know, overall, I really enjoyed reading the paper and thank, for the, thank to the authors for um, doing this interesting work. All right, that's all for my discussion. Thanks so much, Ying. All right, so I guess this is the time we should go back. Nanda, it's the time that everybody should go to room one for the final closing remark. I believe he room one. Nanda may be in the other room, uh, Ingi. So, uh, okay, so thank you all for coming. It was very nice. All right, so we will all go to room one now, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, there may be. Some people in room one and some people in room two. I have two monitors, so I go back and forth. Oh, wow. That's nice. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. So, okay. The messages all go to uh, room one, I think. Yeah, so let's all go to room one. Oh, we all go to room one now. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, room Nanda two comes there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Nanda will give a very quick closing remark, I believe. That's the plan. All right. So I'm going to leave this room then. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I will see everyone in room one.
Ehsan? Yes, Raja. I think yeah, we hi. need to. Yeah, yeah if we, we to, can. Yeah, if yeah. you can stop recording, it would be better. Yeah, I just stop. Yeah, yes, I will. I will do it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Just let me check with Kelly. Kelly, uh, uh, should I stop recording now? Yes, go ahead and stop recording. Thank you. Okay, sure. And you will get the take. Uh, get the um, email and just send it to me. Okay, thank you very much for all you have. Right. Okay, sure. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye.